Hello, this is Robin de Graaf and welcome to another video on the basics of NMR. Today I would like to talk about Fourier transformation. Before we do that, let's quickly review a few things we learned in a previous video on nuclear induction, in which a rotating magnetization vector is uh, rotating in the transverse plane, rotating at a Lamo frequency, and because of time varying of, a, of the time varying magnetic field, it induces a current in, into a receiver coil. Now, that is basically our NMR signal, and it looks something like this, in which there is an oscillation at a Lamo frequency, and you have the signal is slowly decaying away because of T2 star relaxation. Now, this is how it looks like when you observe it along the x-axis. You can also observe it along the y-axis, and later on in this video I'll show you that it's best to observe them along both axes at the same time. Now let's have a little uh, bit of a closer look on this free induction decay. This is clearly a single frequency signal, and uh, the M0, the thermal equilibrium magnetization, can be recognized as the first data point at T is zero. The frequency can be recognized as one divided by this period, and the T2 star relaxation can be recognized as a decay constant on this, on this curve right here. So it's very easy to recognize the parameters when you have a single frequency. But many FIDs that we're going to acquire have more than one frequency. In this case, you probably recognize that there might be two frequencies in there. The first point is now given by M0 from the first you know, type of spin, and M0 from the second type of spin. You can only observe the, the sum at this, at this point. You might recognize it as two frequencies, but the exact frequency frequencies are difficult to separate, and the T2 stars are also difficult to separate. And if we add more frequency components to the free induction decay, and we're getting a more realistic NMR signal, you can recognize that there's many frequencies in here, but what the exact frequencies are, and what their relative intensities are, is very difficult to um, separate. The human eye is very bad at that. So what we need is, we need an automated tool, a mathematical Mathematical tool that allowed that does the separation of frequencies for us. Now that tool is the free induction decay. So we start with our time domain signal. In this case, we have a real component observed along the y-axis and an imaginary component observed simultaneously along the x-axis. Why you need to do that, I'll again explain in a few slides from now. So we know there's a single frequency in there, but let's the tool that we need, that Fourier transformation, basically does the recognizing of the frequency automatically for us. Now, this is how the Fourier transformation looks like mathematically, but what it does is it takes a time domain signal in which the horizontal axis is time and transforms it to a so-called spectrum in the frequency domain in which the horizontal axis is now the frequency. And you can see that this signal is converted to a line and the frequency can be directly read off from the horizontal axis. So it's very easy to get the frequency now. The amplitude is now given by the area under this black curve. Now, I know that uh, like a lot of people are uh, scared off by an equation like this, but it actually turns out to be quite e easy to understand if we separate it out in its individual components. So let's have a let's do that. And at the same time, let's simplify it. Let's go from a Fourier transformation which works on on complex value data let's make it into a cosine transformation which uses real value data this is our experimental signal if you will it's a single frequency signal only the cosine is shown here and it is it's running from zero to infinite time now the Fourier transformation is given by this equation now how do you have to read this you read this as follows you have your experimental data Ft, that's our experimentally measured signal, we multiply it with a, a cosine with a, a test frequency. That a product is then being integrated over all times, and that will be then the value in the spectrum, capital F, at frequency nu. Okay, that's a lot of text. Let's just run it through, and you'll, you'll see it's quite easy. So here we have our raw experimental data, ft, we multiply it with a first like test frequency, 
In this case, we, we try, we test out the signal at 24 Hertz. We multiply the two and the product looks like this. Then we need to integrate over that product over all time. So you basically we just add all of the values together and then you will find that the integral, the sum, is actually zero. That value is now assigned to the frequency 24 Hertz in the spectrum. So what have we achieved here? We have calculated this value in the spectrum. It has a value of zero, which means that our time domain signal does not contain a component at 24 Hertz. So now we can repeat it. Let's calculate it at 23 Hertz, 22 Hertz, etc., etc. Or in this case, we calculate it for 16 Hertz, which is another test frequency. Multiply the original signal with our test frequency, get the product, sum it over all times, and that again gives us zero. So now we have calculated all of these points in the spectrum, and they're all zero, indicating that none of these frequencies is part of our original signal. Okay, let's continue the testing, and let's continue it down to 8 Hertz. Multiply it again with the original signal, and now you can see that the product looks a little bit different in the sense that there are no negative values. So if you now add all of these together, you will get a positive number, something that is greater than zero. And now you can see that in the spectrum, all of a sudden we have a data point that is not zero, indicative of the fact that our time domain signal does contain a frequency of 8 hertz. Now you can, of course, continue this and then the rest will be zero again and so you can see that we have now an automated tool to find the exact frequencies and this will also work of course if there's more than one frequency in there it will just give us a positive signal every time it finds a frequency that is in the data now of course this is a lot of uh, talking over the last few minutes on the computer this can be done in a few milliseconds it's a very very fast and very efficient operation but it is an automated operation and that's exactly what we need. So far we've talked about the cosine transformation. But there is a problem with the cosine transformation. So this is again our original signal. If we apply that cosine transformation and we calculate it all the way down to zero hertz and then we go with the negative frequencies as well, you will find two equally equal intensity frequencies, one at 8 hertz and one at minus 8 hertz. The reason for that is that the cosine of a frequency is equal to the cosine of the negative of that frequency. In other words, you cannot distinguish between a positive and a negative frequency if you only measure the cosine of that frequency. Another way of looking at it is, is that if you look at a rotating ball and you only look along the y-axis, then this ball goes from plus y to zero to minus y to zero to plus y. Or if you plot that out like this. If you now look along the same axis to a ball that goes in the opposite direction, in other words a negative frequency, you will see exactly the same. It starts at plus y, zero, minus y, zero, y. In other words, you cannot distinguish between two frequencies. But this is a problem in NMR and in many other fields of science, we want to be able to distinguish positive and negative frequencies. Now, this can be done by observing the signal also along a second orthogonal axis. That is referred to as quadrature detection. Now, the way that works, we already know this, I showed you this on the previous slide. But what now if you now start looking along the x-axis? The ball starts at 0, then it goes to plus x, 0, minus x. Get this curve. If the ball now rotates the other way around, it goes 0, minus x, 0, plus x. In other words, the curve is exactly inverted. So if you combine the signal measured along the y-axis and measured along the x-axis, you do get unique information that you can use to separate positive and negative frequencies. The way that is typically done is to combine it in a complex number, in which the time domain signal is the real component plus i times the imaginary component. If you are unfamiliar or uncomfortable with, with a complex valued numbers, I suggest that you read up upon that. Um, 
it is going to be very very important in NMR and in science in general so you need to have an understanding of complex numbers I can recommend a Khan Academy that's a very good starting point to start learning about this another way of uh, you know combining this is this is basically a cosine modulated function this is a sine modulated function so if you use this notation you get cosine plus i sine which can be combined into a complex exponential in this case it will be cosine minus i sine and it will again be in a complex exponential but now you can see it's immediately obvious it's a negative frequency so that's why you need to observe the signal along two orthogonal axes in order to separate positive and negative frequencies okay so here we have our uh, one of our two components um, it's, it's like a cosine modulated function if we do the cosine transformation we're going to get a spectrum that has two signals right at plus eight and minus eight the difference between this signal and the previous signal is that earlier the signal was lasting until infinite times in NMR the signal decays because of T2 star relaxation that will lead to a broadening of this signal now with NMR we have not a real signal but we have a complex valued signal where we have one component the real component measured along one axis and the imaginary component along the other orthogonal axis as a result we cannot use the cosine transformation anymore we have to use the Fourier transformation the Fourier transformation works exactly the same way as the cosine transform with the exception that it works on complex value data we have a complex value FID therefore the spectrum will also be a complex entity in which we have a real spectrum in black and a imaginary spectrum in gray on most spectrometers you only observe you only display the real spectrum now let's have a look at our parameters again see if we can still recognize those so on in the time domain m0 was equal to the first point the frequency was 1 divided by the period and t to star is this dk the mathematical function was as follows where you have m0 times a complex exponential describing the frequency times an exponential for the exponentially decaying t2 star relaxation and the three parameters if you do Fourier transformation we know that we're going to get our spectrum the three parameters are still in this spectrum as well but they're just displayed in a different way the frequency that is the biggest advantage is now easy to observe as the horizontal or the number on the horizontal axis m0 can now be recognized as the area under the curve here note that the peak height is not equal to m0 that is equal to m0 times t2 star and i strongly recommend never to use the peak peak height as a substitute because it'll always be complicated by the T2 star relaxation the T2 star relaxation is also proportional to 1 divided by the width at half maximum so the width at half maximum of the peak here is equal to 1 divided by pi times T2 star if this is the function in the time domain following Fourier transformation this will be the function in the frequency domain it is a real part plus a an imaginary part the imaginary part I'm not going to talk about but this real part one can recognize as a so-called Lorentzian line shape now in a, in a future lecture on signal processing we will talk in much more detail about this but most important right now is that you recognize that the three parameters m0 frequency and t2 star are present in the time domain and in the frequency domain there is no new information you just display the existing information in a different way and this is underlined by the fact that the Fourier transformation is an inverse operation that uh, is like a reversible operation so the inverse Fourier transformation takes the spectrum and brings it back to the time domain showing that you don't add any information it's just taking the information and displaying it in a different way now to wrap up just to sh show you why we have done all of this this is uh, an experimental free induction decay you can clearly see there's multiple frequencies in there but it will be very difficult to see is this a proton uh, MR uh, F FID is it from phosphorus is it from liver is it from brain it's very difficult to see 
field Fourier transformation, you get a spectrum like this. Well, a lot of experts in the field of MR spectroscopy will immediately recognize this as a proton spectrum from the brain acquired at medium echo time. Because the human eye is just that much more trained to look at uh, a spectral profile, and that is much more difficult to do in a time domain. So, displaying of our measured data is always done in the spectrum, because that is simply easier to recognize. But again, Fourier transformation is reversible, so there is no nothing new in the spectrum that wasn't present in the FID already. So finally, um, in modern NMR, the signal is always acquired as a free induction decay in a time domain. The Fourier transformation is a mathematical tool to analyze the frequencies in a time domain and then display them and their intensities in the form of a frequency domain spectrum. And that is how the NMR data is typically displayed. If we have an exponentially damped sinusoidal signal in the time domain, we're going to get a Lorentzian frequency domain line shape. And the Fourier transformation is a reversible operation. In other words, the information content in the time and the frequency domain is identical. And we will return uh, to this point in future lectures. There's a few exercises for those who are interested. If you want to contact me, this is how I look like. Uh, you can also shoot me an email. You can visit the website that is uh, under construction right now. And many of the things I talked about can also be found in the third edition of this uh, book. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed this video and that you will visit uh, my YouTube channel uh, in the future to watch some other videos.